All right, all right. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Y'all look awesome. This is going to be a good morning. I just, I love it. I love baptisms. Anyone uh, else love baptisms? Oh, man, they're just so sweet. You watch people kind of take their faith public, and and they're really declaring it to everyone. And so, welcome to everyone joining us online as well as in VR. I'm just, uh, I believe God's going to do some really sweet things during this next hour together, or next half hour together. It's going to be really great. Uh, Today, we start a series on the book of Acts. Some of you are like, I don't know what Acts is all about. Well, it's going to be good. We're calling it Unstoppable. Uh, And the reason why I'm calling it unstoppable is because that is really what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to be an unstoppable force to to deal with, uh, individually and collectively. That it is this unstoppable move of what God can do in and through ordinary people. Uh, and, and part of even why, what I anchor this thing to is, is a statement that Jesus made about the church. He made it to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, when he said this. He said, upon this rock, and he was talking to Peter. Uh, so Peter's going to help establish the church. Uh, but he says, upon you, Peter, this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Are, are you hearing this here? That this is what the church is supposed to look like. No matter how much the devil wants to take us down, no matter how how much it seems like the enemy comes against us, the church will always be growing, and it will be because Jesus is the one who's going to build it. And it's our responsibility to literally just posture our hearts in surrender and be obedient. And as we do so, we'll step into actually the call that God has for us, which is not to be a passive church. It's not to be passive people, but it's actually to be an unstoppable force moving forward with great boldness. And uh, I'm I'm just excited about this uh, series. And what we see modeled throughout the whole book of Acts is this. It's this unstoppable church, if you will. Um, We're going to be looking at Acts, really, I'd call it kind of the flyby. So the 50,000 foot view, and then every week we'll probably dive all the way down to a 1,000 foot view and dive into one or two verses kind of from the section that we're looking at. Just go, okay, what is... What would the Lord want to teach us today out of kind of these chapters that we're covering? Because we will. We'll cover quite a few chapters each, each week. But here, let's start with this. Why, why is Acts called Acts? What's the backdrop of Acts? Well, it's, it's this. Acts is the bridge, really, between the life of Christ, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is the account of Christ's life, and then what we would refer to as the letters. And so the letters are, are the Pauline epistles. So Paul writes all these letters to the different churches uh, that he helps establish, as well as some of the early apostles write some, some letters as well. And so this is this a historical book that captures really the establishment of the early church. It was likely written by Luke. The reason why it's called Acts is because it really is the actions of these early leaders as well as the action of the Spirit of God moving through those early leaders in establishment of the church. It covers a 32-year historical period of time. So while you might read it and plow through a bunch of chapters in one sitting, perhaps, the reality is this is over a 32-year period of time. And so it doesn't, it's not like, man, this is all happening. Some things do happen really fast in the book of Acts, but then there's other things that they just, they, they play out over time. So it is over a period of time. If I were to title the first five chapters of the book of Acts, I would, by a location, I would call it Jerusalem, because that's where the first five chapters take place. They all take place in Jerusalem. In fact, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is probably a great template for actually what we see unfold in the book of Acts. So let, let's read Acts 1 8. I read this to you last week. Um, this is Jesus' final words to the disciples before he ascends to heaven. But he says this. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. That, that uh, statement of how they're going to be witnesses is really what we see unfold in the book of Acts. It starts in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, and then we could say the ends of the earth, at least to their knowledge at that point, but as they continue to take the gospel further uh, away from Jerusalem. So that's kind of the, the template. Acts takes this amazing, I would say, uh, moment where it takes it into another gear, 
in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 changes everything for the church. Because it's where we see, for the very first time, the Holy Spirit be placed inside Christ followers and what Christ followers are. I, I believe the normative lifestyle of a Christ follower. And it happens at the day of Pentecost. That's why what we refer to it. It's Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. If you've never read it, you really should read it this week. But it's, it's, it's this. It's when the Holy Spirit comes upon these early disciples and they start speaking in tongues, which is different languages. And it was languages that all these people, uh, because it was, a, uh, it was a religious celebration at that time, all these people have come from all over the world into Jerusalem. As they're hearing the disciples talk, they're hearing them speak in their their own languages, all these different languages. And it draws a crowd because they're hearing them declare the praises of God. And so as this crowd comes around, everyone is just in awe because, man, this is clearly not of them. This is the power of the Holy Spirit in these early Christ followers. And I believe the rest of the book of Acts is really what we should call the normative lifestyle of, of Christians. I know some of you are like, no, the day of Pentecost, that was a crazy day. No, it's supposed to be the normal day. It, this, is, this is, I believe, not, not just the standalone unique day. It is, the, it is what models what should be the life of Christians and Christ followers. And so what happens, though, is the crowds gather because they're hearing all these disciples speak in different languages, and they're like, that's clearly a work of God. And so as the crowds gather, Peter will give really the first gospel presentation to a massive crowd of people. And this is kind of the climax of his speech. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 24, I'm going to read quite a few verses today just to kind of help us understand what's taking place here. Uh, This is the climax of that speech. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs by which God did among you through him, uh, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. This is what we celebrated last week at Easter, freeing him. From the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Now, I don't know if you really caught it, but he's talking to a group of of Israelites here. And he, I don't know if you you see the number of times he drops you. He's like, listen, he did all these miracles in front of you. You guys all totally knew that, that it was real. It was legitimate. He was handed over to you and you guys, with the help of wicked men, crucified him. Like, Peter's not pulling any punches here, right? Like, you guys, you guys, you guys. I can imagine they might be getting a little offended, maybe a little frustrated, but notice how they respond. I love this. It's such a good response. Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice their hearts. Their hearts were broken. And, and, and I see that this is always true. When people give their lives to Christ, it's always a place of complete brokenness, humility, desperation. It's a place of surrender, total surrender. This is where they're at. And notice how, how it plays out here, verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. I would call that explosive church growth. That, that's a pretty good day in any church world right there. 3,000, holy cow, like how do you even manage that and deal with it? But, but what I love about it is that this crowd of 3,000 that become really the first New Testament church, they were the same crowd that crucified him just a month before. They, those people, this is cool, those people who were guilty of crucifying our Savior, they become the first church. The early church. And the early days of the first church are really exciting. I mean, the church is growing. Acts tells us that they're growing by the numbers literally by the day. There's so many people coming to Christ. Everyone actually seems to be kind of getting along. Everything's good. Then Acts chapter 3 happens. Wah, wah, wah. (laughs) And so here's what happens in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. Let me just summarize it. Peter and John are walking into the temple, and on their way on in there, they come across a beggar who's lame, and he's been crippled, he's uh, been begging his entire life. 
And they beg, or he begs from Peter and John, please give me some, something. And Peter makes this kind of iconic statement, okay, which maybe you've heard before, but let me read it to you. It's verse 3, and I just, I love it because once again, it, it should become the normative mindset for all of us Christians. He says this in verse 6, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. The, I, I guess I memorized that probably in the King James Version where it's just, silver or gold have I none, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. And I, what I love about this is that we see a mental shift that I think all of us need to make as Christ followers. And the mental shift is this, is that we've got to take our eyes off of what we see in the natural and fix our eyes on what we have, which is in the supernatural. We, we, we literally need to shift from a perspective of, of earthly lack to a perspective of kingdom abundance, which is ours. Are, are you with me here? Are you tracking with me? It, it's, here's what this means. It means that we have to start thinking through the, through the lens of heaven and what heaven has. So you may not be a doctor, but you can still pray for healing. You may not be rich, but you can still pray for provision. You may not be the smartest, but you can still pray for wisdom. You may not be a counselor, but you can still pray for comfort. You may not be a leader, but you can still pray for direction. Are, are you hearing this? Like, there's, there's things that you might say, in my natural state, I don't seem to carry this. And yet, because it's what God actually has, I have the rights because Christ, when he, when he died on the cross, it says the curtain that, that was in the Holy of Holies, the curtain was torn. In that moment, here's the amazing thing, that curtain was what separated really humanity from God. And so only the high priest could go behind the curtain once a year. On the, at the moment that Christ is crucified, it tells us that the curtain is torn. And what that means is that you and I now can go into the, the throne room of God and approach God without uh, fear of approaching him. It's not because we can just go in there all willy-nilly and treat God like he's nothing. It's that our holy God has actually invited us into this relationship, and the relationship is out of a friendship perspective where he says, now would you minister my kingdom on my behalf to the people around you? D does this make sense? So here's the, the, the follow-up question. How many of you would like to see God do more miraculous things in and through you in your life? If you're a Christian, your hands should be in the air. If you're not a Christian, you might be like, I'm just wigged out right now. <laughs> glad, glad you're here. Okay. If you're a Christ follower, yes, you should always want, I want more of, this is how Jesus taught us how to pray. He said, pray this way, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Meaning what is the heavenly realities that, you, that, that are yours, God, we want those to come here on earth. Now, now here's the, the question, the kind of the follow-up question. I said, how many of you want to see more miracles now? How many of you pray for miracles? Hey, some of you. Okay, now, okay, no show of hands. How many of you pray for miracles over people out loud? <laughs> okay, the, the hands start dropping. Here, here's the deal. I, if you're like me, maybe growing up as a Christian, I prayed for things all the time. I just didn't have a boldness in that. And I, I really believe that the Lord often re responds to actually our boldness. He, re he responds to our faith in action in a bold way. And so, um, if I were to ask you, how many people have prayed for cancer and cancer has been gone? Probably there might be maybe one or two of you who might have experienced something like that. But most of you would probably be like, oh, I, I wouldn't have not prayed for that and seen that happen. How many of you have prayed for a headache to go away for somebody? Well, probably more of you are that. But here's, if I could challenge you in any way, it would be this. 
start, start with the small things and be okay with that. But be bold stepping into that. There was, it was probably 15, 20 years ago. For one year of my life, I decided I was going to make a rule for myself. And that is anytime I came up, uh, uh, face-to-face with anyone who had a headache, I was going to ask them if I could pray for their headache to be gone right there on the spot, out loud with them. And so I did that for an entire year. And, and the reason why is because I wanted to see my faith grow and I wanted to see like the stuff that we see in Acts that I believe should be normative. I wanted to start seeing that in my life. And so how will that be normative in my life and normal in my life if I'm never trying it? And so I started with the small things, headaches. And what I discovered is that God started using me as I'm praying for people's headaches and most headaches would go away or at least decrease in pain. And what, as that started happening, then I became more and more confident. Like anytime I saw a headache or heard of someone, I was like, I got this, you know? I was like, we, I was like well, we got this, God's got this, but let's go after it. And, and like nine times out of 10, their headache would just go away or it would diminish right there on the spot. And, and then I found myself being more bold in praying for people with chronic pain or whatever it might be. And, and as I did so, my faith would increase. And I think I started stepping into more of the normal lifestyle as a Christ follower just because I started taking those risks. Maybe you've heard the statement, you'll miss 100% of the shots that you don't take right? You'll miss 100% of the miracles that you don't pray for. And I, I'm not saying like, hey, someone has a headache and you go, I'll pray for you. And then you leave and you pray for them like quietly behind. Like just pray for them. Peter didn't say to the beggar, we'll pray for you when we get to the temple. He just said, I'm, I'm going to go for it. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And so he just went for it. And, and once again, I, I don't know. For me, I'd never feel bad making a try because I just look at it and I go, I'll miss 100% that I don't try for. So I might as well try. So here's what we're going to do. We didn't do this Thursday night, but I just, before the service started, I felt like the Lord said, let's practice. So we're going to practice, okay? So here's what we're going to specifically go after, chronic pain, okay? Maybe you've got a headache, maybe you've got chronic pain. If that is you, would you just slip your hand up real quick? Okay, anyone with chronic pain? Okay, now if someone's got a hand up beside you or near you, you're a winner, okay? Because you get to pray for them. Uh, And so if you've got someone with a a hand up that's right around you, near you, would you just put your hand on their shoulder, okay? Just just reach on over, and we're just going to pray for them right now. And I've got chronic pain right now on my lower back, so I'm going to, daughter, come on up here, and you can pray over me, okay? I'll pray. And, um, and we're just going to pray over these people, okay? Oh, Jesus. We come into the throne room because the curtain was torn and, we have, and you've invited us here, not by our own authority or our own ability, but because you call us friends. And because of the work of the cross and what Jesus did for us at the cross, we can pray that chronic pain is removed right now in Jesus' name. We just know in heaven that doesn't exist. In heaven that's not there. You told us to pray on earth as it is in heaven, and in heaven that's not there. And so God, would you just release your healing right now over chronic uh, pain? Would you remove those pains right now in Jesus' name? We plead the blood of Jesus over these bodies. We just know that by your stripes we are healed, and so we pray that uh, even if it's a a little bit better, we are going to give thanks and praise to you for the way that you... uh, that you touch bodies, you bring restoration, you bring healing in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you guys for doing so. Thank you for doing so. Now, whew. oh, I feel so much better. And I'm not lying to you. I've been in so much pain for so long. Almost every Sunday I go off to the stage and I just curl up on the ball on the floor. It's been like nine months. Anyone else feeling a little bit? I don't know. I, I always just go, God, more, 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 more. But this is like real grace. Uh, anyone else feeling a little bit better? Uh, no, not, not just like feeling good in the room, but like, oh, I feel good in the room. But like, uh, who was just prayed over that you're like, man, I, I, I like whatever was just prayed over, I feel like significantly better. Praise God. 
Praise God. And I, I don't do this because it's like making this stuff up. Like, man, I've been in pain for nine months. Oh, and I just felt like the Lord said, I think we've got to practice this stuff and we've got to believe this stuff and we've got to go for this stuff because this is like the normative stuff of the early church and it's our reality. And so, so now here's the cool thing. So Peter and John, man, my back feels so much better. Thank you, Jesus. Hold on. I'm just enjoying not being in pain. feels really good. I still have a little ways to go. Maybe the 1030 will get me the rest of the way there. (laughs) But it feels really good. So Peter and John, they get arrested because they healed this guy. And then they're thrown in prison overnight. And the next day, uh, they're being questioned. And once again, they basically share the gospel. And I just love this. So it's going to come to, this is Acts chapter 4 verse 12. And in verse 12, it says this. This is kind of their climax statement of the gospel. And then there's an observation statement made over them. And here it is, Acts 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name in heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And right there, they're kind of like, guys, it's Jesus. And then here's the observation statement made over them. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I love that verse. Verse 13 is probably my favorite verse. Maybe not, not in all of scripture, but it's up there. It's one of my top 10 because it's probably, it's, it's one of these things that within it, what you see is something that should be bringing such hope to every single one of us in this room. Okay, so here's just three things that should bring you hope. First one is this. They saw courage. They saw these guys, and they saw that they had courage. Would anyone like more courage in life? More confidence in life? Like, the ability to not have your emotions ride the roller coaster of what's happening in culture as well as in the news. Like, we just live courageously. That when, it's, when the Lord's called us to pray for someone, you're, you're not nervous about that. Or maybe there's a little bit of nerves, but there's a courage within you to face that, that thing. Right? I, I think all of us would go, I, I, I want that. Well, here's the deal. You are, in Christ, a courageous person. And you want to know why that is? Because he's courageous. And then when he places his Holy Spirit in you, which is what happens at Pentecost, is that the Holy Spirit is now the new normative for everyone who calls themselves a Christ follower. He puts his spirit in you that you have the courage of the King of Kings in your heart. And so here's what I often have to do is I've got to preach to myself regularly when I find the things that are mine in the kingdom of heaven being attacked. And so when I find myself fearful or nervous about anything, I literally have to preach to myself you have courage. Be courageous. This is yours. Hey, look to the person to, to, uh, that's next to you and just stare them in the eyes and say, you are courageous. Some of you didn't look at someone, maybe because you're not courageous. Now look at the person on the other side of you and say, you are courageous. Now look at the person behind you, which some of you are going to have to look forward and some of you look behind. Otherwise, you're going to be staring at back of heads and tell them you're courageous. Now listen, if you're a Christ follower, later today, tell your spouse 
you are courageous. Tell your children you are courageous. Tell those in your, in your groups, in your small groups, you are courageous. Tell people on your serve teams, you are courageous. If you come face to face with another Christ follower, tell them who they are in Christ Jesus. Because they are, this is who we're wired to be. And, and this is, it's something that we have to renew our minds in the truth of who we are in Christ. It's what they carried, and it's what they took note of. These, the, the religious leaders go, this is what's unique about these early Christians. They are courageous people. And that should be true of the Christ followers 2,000 years later. That the world should be able to take note of us and say, I see something in them. These people carry courage. Second observation that is made over them is this. They were unschooled and ordinary men. I absolutely love that because that brings me such hope because many of us feel like, that's me. I'm just unschooled, an ordinary person. Now, here's what you got to know. All of these guys at some point, I'm not going to go through the whole ordeal of of their upbringing, but all of them at some point were actually uh, dropouts of school. The reason why we know that is because everyone's goal in that day and age was to go through Jewish school, which would have led you to ultimately be the religious elite. The best of the best became Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, religious leaders, scribes, things like that. If you didn't make the cut, you got kicked out of school and you were told basically go home, learn the family business, help out at the family farm, that type of thing. So Jesus' uh, disciples, what makes them unique is that they are all ordinary guys. They were fishermen, they were carpenters, they're tax collectors. They, I mean, they're, they're blunt, blunt sinners in that day and age. The, the thing that makes his disciples so unique is there was nothing special about them. Yay, for all of us. As if you feel like, I don't know, I don't feel like the smartest, I don't feel like the greatest, I don't feel like, uh, like the, the premiere of anything in any area of my life. You're perfect. Because God just loves using the ordinary to do the extraordinary. That is the model, actually, of the church and the early church, is that God takes the ordinary and he uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. And maybe you've felt over your years that the enemy's been whispering in your, in your ear, uh, you'll never do much for God, or you'll never know scripture well enough, or you'll never be a spiritual leader in your family, or God will never use you because of your past, or God wouldn't use you to impact other people, or your past is too messed up, or you're too young, or you're too old, or it's too late, or whatever the thing is that the enemy's whispering to you, and, and you can just, uh, just shout back at him, I might be ordinary, but God does it, the extraordinary through the ordinary. That is the norm of the early church, and that's for us as well. He doesn't, God doesn't need the smartest or the brightest. He just, um, he just needs surrendered hearts who are completely sold out to him. Third and final thing, and I just love this. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. They saw courage. (laughs) They they saw that they were just ordinary men, and then they took note that they had been with Jesus. Hey, if you want, you want courage? You want to do the extraordinary for God? You, You want... The, the key to all this, the key to the extraordinary, the key to the fruit of the Spirit, the key to the abundant life, the key to the life of miracles, the key for all of this is hanging out with Jesus. Amen. It's spending time in God's Word. It's talking with Him in prayer. It's worshiping Him along with maybe music. It's sitting on the front porch with Jesus and just talking with Him and, and thinking about some of the things that He did. That's called meditation. You just take some of Scripture and just you just turn that thing over in your heart and your mind. You sit with Jesus in that and you'll say, God, would you just transform my life as I process some of the things you said and some of the things that Jesus modeled. We have to be with Jesus. Uh, for, for these guys, the only thing that they were trying to find some level of guilt over the disciples so that they could actually accuse them of something and then um, punish them for something. But the only guilt they could find is they had been hanging out with Jesus. Would you and I be found guilty of being a friend of Jesus? Would, would someone ever say over you, hey, I don't know much about that person, but they sh- sure seem to like Jesus a lot. I sure hope that's true of us. I don't know if you've heard this uh, stat before, but it's, it's, or this rule. It's called the rule of 18s. The rule of 18s is this. If you spend 18 minutes a day doing anything, you will be in the top 95 percentile or 95th percentile of 
everyone on the planet in that area. So I could say the top 5% performers in that area. So if you want to be a great free throw shooter, if you shoot free throws for 18 minutes a day, you will be in the top 5% free throw shooters in the world. If, if you want to be an amazing ping pong player, play for 18 minutes a day, you'll be in the top 5% in the world. If you want to speak Spanish, practice for 18 minutes a day, you'll be in the top 5% in the world. I mean, like, that's pretty cool, right? All these different things. If, if you want to be a good artist, well, then draw and doodle and do art for 18 minutes a day, you will be in the top 5% in the world. And now, now think about it this way. If you invest in your family for 18 minutes a day, you will be in the top Five percent investors in their families in the world. If you serve your spouse for 18 minutes a day, I know some of the spouses are like, you should go for that ranking right there. <laughs> Top five percent best serving of spouses in the world. If you hung out with Jesus for 18 minutes a day. Now I know it's not a competition for us to be the, in the top 5% like Christ. It's not a competition, but it is what the world deserves. It's what the world needs, is that we actually become the unstoppable church that God always had in mind. It, it's, it's what God deserves of a, a surrendered life back to him, is that we just give it all to him. I just wonder what could... What could happen if a church like Lakeland, if we actually, if we all hung out with Jesus for 18 minutes a day, we would be functioning like the early church. We would be unstoppable. Absolutely unstoppable. I love when, I, when we hear stories of how people's lives are being transformed because they've been hanging out with Jesus and what Jesus is doing in their lives. In fact, we've got, uh, I think, 20-some people being baptized this morning, I think 10 during this service. Um, and really, that's a reflection as they want to proclaim their faith of what Jesus has been doing in their life. And I often look at baptism as it's just this propelling moment forward in their faith. Here's just one person's story. We just want to real, uh, show this video of, of one lady who's being baptized this weekend, whose uh, life has been transformed just hanging out with Jesus. Go ahead and roll it. Tell me a little bit about your story growing up. Um, I was born in a family of four siblings, my mom and my dad. They were heavy drinkers, my dad was. And we were very dysfunctional. And I thought that God didn't love me. So I grew up pretty much not believing in God because I felt it was something I had done as a child. So I pretty much um, turned to drugs and alcohol <laughs> to, uh, I guess, self-medicate all the pain and the hurt that I felt growing up. And finally, I had hit rock bottom and decided I just surrendered myself to God and told him I couldn't do it anymore without him. My son, Tavier, mm -hmm. he goes to youth group on Wednesdays, and I went to drop him off and felt just this amazing warmth when I drove into the parking lot and I told Tavier I wanted to attend. And when I started coming to church, I found happiness there. And at the end of the service, I would go to the prayer group and ask for prayers. I didn't know what I needed. So I would say, I know that God knows what I need. And um, that got me through the week. And I just couldn't wait for the following Sunday to come so I could come to church. And God could help me because I didn't know what to do with my life. I usually went to the same couple. And they, by that time, had another couple that were going to be training for prayer. and. I thought to myself, 
holy crap, I really need help. God has four people there for me. And it was kind of amazing because they talked to me or they prayed and um, I felt an enormous warmth run through my body because one of the things that I, my head was telling me was that I was such a horrible person and I couldn't sleep at night. And that was what I asked for prayers for. And um, that night when I went to sleep, I didn't have those thoughts anymore. And I knew at that point that God was with me. He was there. And I'm just grateful for this church, actually, because and I'm grateful that Tavier had me drop him off for youth group because I think God led me there because he knew how broken I was and he knew that I needed to be saved. My journey with God is isn't complete, it's just beginning. It's like an amazing feeling knowing that I'm giving myself to the Lord and doing more for Him and being more grateful. I am so grateful for everything He's done because I remember where I came from and where He's lifted me up from. And now I'm this happy person that I've never been happier my whole life. Mm, I love it. I love that started with bringing her, you know, grandson to, to youth group. And, um, man, so sweet. The people who are being baptized today, they've all put their faith in Christ. We, we practice believer's baptism here at Lakeland. That means that baptism is a symbolic and yet uh, obedient step in our faith. So symbolic because as we go under the water, it's actually, um, it's a a beautiful picture. The Apostle Paul talks about it in the book of Romans, this beautiful picture of being buried with Christ and being raised with him. Just like Christ went in the grave and came out of the grave, that's what we celebrate at Easter. As we go under the water, well, if you stay there, that's like going to the grave. So, but we don't stay there. We come out of the grave and there's this beautiful picture of our old life being buried with Christ, It was all taken care of at the cross. As we come out of the water, it's this new life that we are walking with Christ. These people don't claim to be perfect, um, as none of us are. But it's our commitment to say we're walking with Jesus. We want to be people who will be guilty of anything that someone would say, you know what they're guilty of? Hanging out with Jesus. And that Jesus is their friend. And so uh, as we do baptisms, we pray over people right here, our prayer partners. If you've never been a part of one of our baptisms here, if you're here to support someone who's being baptized, we would invite you to come right up here to the prayer circles when they're up here, um, and we'll pray over them, and then we're going to baptize them right here. If you're here just uh, celebrating with us, just hoop, holler, cheer, because this is a really exciting step as they're uh, they're taking their faith public. Let's all stand. I'm going to pray, and then uh, those being baptized come right on up here. Our prayer partners come up right now as well. Jesus, we just thank you for those who are taking their their faith public right now. This is bold. This is courageous. Lord, we pray that you would uh, respond to that and to their taking of their faith public, that you would deposit sweet things in their life, that you would propel their spiritual journeys with you forward, faster, take it to new levels. I thank you that they're taking their faith public and we are just celebrating what they're, dis- what they're putting on display this morning. Lord, I pray over every person here that w- as we're sitting there going, we might be ordinary people. Lord, would you take us to a place where courage is the norm, faith in the action or in action, the ordinary doing the extraordinary is the norm. That we'd be people that would be guilty of hanging out with Jesus. That that would be what would be said of us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Those being baptized, come on right up here to the front. Worship team's going to be playing music. You can sing along during it. Let's get the party started.
just so sweet. I love that. Do you not love that? It's so good. So good. Hey, if I can, uh, if you were stirred in some way where you're like, "Ah, that should be me. I need to make that next step. 
in my faith and proclaim my faith publicly in baptism. We've got baptisms in two weeks as well from today. And so if you're interested, grab this card. It's right in the chair back in front of you. There's also a QR code right on there. You can just scan it and fill, fill it out later if you want. But there's a box on here where you can just say, I'd like more information about baptism. I think we've got already, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 people that we're following up with already for that weekend. And so you can be a part of that crew of people who are interested in taking their faith public. And we'd love to follow up with you. If you need prayer, our prayer partners um, uh, will be right down here at the front for anything that you're facing in life or just maybe you just want a word of encouragement. They would love to encourage you and pray over you. Um, Otherwise, be blessed. We'll see you guys next week.